Well, thank you very much. This is a fantastic day in my life, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, 20 years ago, I wore this T-shirt. Uh, it was the first World Wide Web conference, and Tim Berners-Lee talk at that conference changed my life. It blew my mind away as to what we could do uh, in the digital century. Uh, I have only worn it once before, so this is its second time out in 20 years, and that is to honour uh, Wikimania for its tremendous opportunity to change the world. So, uh, I'm going to talk about Content Mine, which is a project which is funded uh, by the Shuttleworth Foundation, which has given me the opportunity uh, to build something completely new and different. Where's my clicker? How do I... Uh, oh, I'll just do this. Okay. Um, so, we are going to use machines to liberate scientific facts on a massive scale. Uh, and we're going to put them in Wikidata. Now, a day ago, I didn't have this vision. So it's because I've been here with yourselves, and I'm going, instead of yourselves, I'm going to say ourselves, because I am part of uh, Wikimedia. Uh, and uh, we are going to change the world. So we are now all scientists. Everybody in this room is a scientist because they have Wikipedia. They are empowered to understand science. Uh, and that is a change uh, from, uh, let us say, even five years ago. Now we have this information prosthetic, which allows all of us to be experts up to a level in any uh, subject uh, that we think. So we are a social machine. We heard about this uh, this morning. And we are going to build this social machine and make science available uh, to the whole world. Everything in my presentation is open data, open source, open standards, open everything. And I want to make it clear that unless everything is completely open, then you cannot build on it. There must not be a single bit of friction. It's like superconductivity. Unless you get down to minus, uh, sorry, to four Kelvin, you suddenly get that loss of resistance, which means that you can do magic. When we get open, we get magic uh, in the information era. And the problem is that so many people coming up with great ideas get bought out by commercial organizations. And we've seen this uh, in this meta-science and science area. Uh, they get bought up by publishers, by um, private companies, and so on. So I give you my promise, I will never sell out uh, to a non-transparent organization. Uh, I believe in Wikipedia. In 2005, I joined it. I didn't have a, um, uh, a username until 2006. 2006, I looked around for uh, the analog of open source in data. So I coined the term open data. Open data did not exist as a term in 2006. That is hard to believe. So I thought, rather than um, just a little bit of uh, hacking around, I will set up a page on Wikipedia for open data. Uh, and that was the way that I was able to flesh out with a number of collaborators what was known about open data at that time. In 2009, Wikipedia came, was still under a lot of attack. It still is as junk. Academics are appalling. Uh, academics are incredibly arrogant, and instead of welcoming Wikipedia as the digital enlightenment, they trashed it as rubbish. Uh, and at a, future, uh, a meeting on the future of the digital library, um, I said that the bit of Wikipedia that I wrote is correct. Now, it's a little bit arrogant because it shouldn't be I, it should be we. Uh, but nevertheless, that was the message. It got through in The Guardian, uh, who published it. At least one person was standing up from academia and saying Wikipedia is the future. And I also said that Wikipedia was the digital library of uh, the 21st century, the century of the digital enlightenment. In 2012, 
uh, I found that uh, the Springer publisher, um, uh, Springer Verlag, had copyrighted lots of my CC BY photos uh, and was selling them at $60 uh, dollars a piece with the label Copyright Springer over them. Uh, so I flipped out, uh, I alerted uh, Wikipedia to this, and they found that a, a thousand of their images had also been copyrighted. We have a real problem, uh, and this illustrates the fact that commercial organizations wish to own and resell and control content. And here I am saying uh, now that I believe that for maths, physical, and biological sciences, I trust Wikipedia, and that Wikidata is the future of science data. So, I started with chemistry, and here's Wikichemistry. Uh, it's, uh, I describe this as meritocratic, critical, volunteer community. And I was inspired by that. And when I came uh, to chemistry, there was virtually no open source, and it was not revered. Uh, it was rubbish because it was free. In chemistry, if something is free, it's ipso facto rubbish, because unless you pay for it, uh, it isn't any good. And that still holds today. Chemistry is one of the most conservative subjects in science. So I started something called the Blue Obelisk. Uh, we met under the Blue Obelisk in San Diego, uh, and uh, there are a number of us also doing open data and open uh, source, and I thought, if we can all share a common vision and a label, then uh, we will be able to help ourselves the Blue Obelisk has cost $10 a year uh, to run. Uh, it has no meetings. Uh, it has a mantra, open data, open source, open standards. And that, and the mailing list, is the sole thing that keeps it going. And it has over 20 members. It has scientific publications. It has the world's best chemical software. Now, I wish to repay that debt. Is there anyone here who is a wiki chemist? Come on down, because I am going to give you a blue obelisk. And this is an award uh, to Wikichemistry. This is to the whole of Wikichemistry. It's not just a personal award. And here you go. And... I expect to see this page changed by the end of my talk, because it's a list of all the award winners. So, in science, we pay half a trillion dollars per year to fund public science. Now, that's a wonderful figure. Um, I don't know it exactly, because nobody knows it exactly. So, the numbers up here are guesstimates, but I think they're quite good guesstimates. Um, and, um, uh, we pay this huge amount of sum, mainly from governments, but also from charities, um, and it results in one and a half million publications. That's also a guess. If you divide, each, bit, each published piece of work costs $300,000 to fund. Um, and um, that, seem, that sounds a hell of a lot, but actually I think it's about right. Now, if you want to tell the world about this, you don't just stick it up on your web page. What you do is you send it off to a publisher who holds it there for a period, often uh, as much as six months, uh, and then takes money either off you or off university libraries, or in many cases off both, to publish it. Uh, and this is a business model which is incredibly uh, valuable for those people who run it, because they make $10 billion a year or more, uh, which is paid for mainly out of the public purse, uh, mainly through academic libraries. And academic libraries, uh, their main purpose now in science is simply to rent, not buy, rent electronic uh, content from publishers. So, in my view, this is a dystopia. And it's, uh, it's shown by the fact that 99.9% .9 of uh, the people in the world do not have access to this uh, on anything other than an extortionate basis. How many people here do not have daily access to a university library? 
Right, the majority. You are what I call the scholarly poor, and it is you uh, that I'm uh, particularly sympathetic to. Technically, it costs $7 to publish a paper. There is a free preprint server called Archive, which does physics. Uh, it runs extremely effectively, and uh, they cost, as I say, $7. And they get uh, hundreds of thousands of papers a year. But because it doesn't give scientists uh, the glory that they require, it doesn't give universities the glory they require, uh, it is not regarded as proper science. You only get uh, glory if you publish in one of these glamour magazines uh, which charges huge amounts and rejects nearly all the science that is submitted to it. Now, science is enormously valuable for us, uh, and the US government paid the Battelle Corporation four billion, uh, sorry, they paid them uh, to uh, do a survey on how valuable the Human Genome Project was. It cost $4 billion, uh, and some years later, it had yielded $800 billion uh, of downstream wealth and 4 million job years. So there is no question that science, properly done, is a wonderful public good. However, that is the exception. And now I'm going to be gloomy for about five slides. It gets better. Firstly, most of that science is wasted. The Lancet said that 85% of research funds were wasted, flawed design, non-publication, and poor reporting. Many scientists only publish 20% of the work that they do. I have this measure in my own department in Cambridge. Our crystallographer says that uh, only 20% of the crystal structures that we do in the department are, are published, even though they are all fit for publication. Uh, and we have a later one with PLOS Medicine here. The publication process, you might think, enhances the value of what goes through it. In many cases, it actually makes it much worse. So that the, publish, uh, the publisher receives a manuscript which can be readily transformed into a semantic object, LaTeX or Word. And then they turn it into PDF. Now, PDF is about the worst possible medium in the digital world for conveying information. I spent two years beating my head on PDF. Uh, it has no words in. It has no paragraphs. It has no subscripts. It simply has characters. Uh, we're going to... Sorry. Uh, we're going to come to this... Uh, where's my... I'll try and do it so it doesn't... That's, pa that's a paper. We're going to see it later. It took me several months to be able to read that in PDF and make sure that all the bits uh, were correct, the um, italics, the different font sizes, the subscripts, and so on. PDFs do not have tables in. They do not have columns. This table at the bottom here is unreadable by almost all PDF readers. And uh, when publishers get uh, SVGs, which, as you know, is semantic graphics, uh, they turn it into JPEGs because it's easier to process and doesn't get corrupted on their awful websites. Now, uh, we have PLOS coming after us, so they have a chance of reply. And PLOS is uh, one of the better publishers. Uh, its morals are fine. Its technical quality still destroys science. It's worse. Here's the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge, so I'm not making this up. I uh, asked by Michelle Brook um, uh, three months ago about Elsevier and the huge amounts of money we pay Elsevier as universities. And at the bottom, you can see Elsevier is looking at ways in which it can control open data as a private company rather than the public bodies concerned. And Elsevier has set up a research institute uh, in University College London. We are in a race against this. We here in this room have the opportunity uh, to create open data before it gets closed down. So that is my request to us. Let us get moving. The publishers have said we cannot mine their data. We cannot use machines. Now I'm going to show you in a minute how we use machines. We cannot use those machines to extract this uh, because, and they give spurious reasons like, there's no demand for it, and if we do it, it'll burn our servers out, which are not quite compatible. 
Uh, and uh, it's now got to a stage where the STM Publishers, which is an association, is actually now essentially uh, fighting the, um, uh, you know, the forces for liberation, such as the British Library, uh, the RCUK, JISC, and uh, even myself and Ross Mounts. Ross, stand up and take a bow. Uh, because Ross, as a graduate student, went to Brussels and fought uh, these publishers uh, and his case triumphed. And this is a tragic side. This is what you will see if you go out and look for Ebola on the web. Ebola is destroying the people in West Africa. And if you want to read about it, it will cost you $31. Uh, and that should be a public paper. And that is an outrage. Uh, the Lancet is an Elsevier journal, but the same is true, Springer, Wiley, Nature, uh, and the others. Okay, switch off the gloom, because it's going to get better. So, here's open access. Open access uh, is not yet working uh, in, uh, uh, in academia, but the vision of the Budapest Open Access Initiative is incredible. I want you to take this language on board because it's wonderful. And I actually think it applies brilliantly uh, to Wikipedia and Wikimedia and Wikidata and so on. Completely free and unrestricted access, scholars, teachers, and other curious minds. That's a wonderful phrase. And at the bottom, sharing the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich, because this does not happen in science, and it is a major drawback uh, to what we have at the moment. So, how are we going to tackle this? Well, the, uh, I, as I say, I have been fortunate uh, to be funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation, and we are building a system which is going to liberate 100 million facts a year from the scientific literature. And we assert that if you have the right to read a document, you have the right to mine it and to publish the facts. And the British government uh, has uh, taken on board the Hargreaves report, and from June the 1st this year, we are now in the UK allowed to do this. We can use machines to read the literature and export the facts, and nothing that the publishers can do, uh, 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 there is no legal instrument they can use to stop us doing it. So we're going to do it, and we want uh, us to join us. So, <laughs> science is growing so fast uh, that we cannot read it all. Every scientist you talk to says, I cannot keep up with the literature. So the, uh, Tim O'Hane from Macmillan says, well, the way to do this is to label most science as unimportant and just have some really top-class journals. Could that be nature, right? Okay. Uh, my uh, approach, the content minds approach, is that we use machines to help us understand the literature. And I'm going to show you that with machines, all of us here, as symbiotes between humans and machines, uh, can do that. I use the word amanuensis, which is a rather nice word, as a scholarly assistant. And here in the bottom uh, is Eric Fenby, the um, uh, amanuensis of Frederick Delius. So, it consists of the following, crawling the scientific literature. There is an absolute imperative. We need an open bibliography of the whole scientific literature. That is not a difficult thing to conceive of, and it's not a very difficult thing to do technically. It just seems politically uh, absurd that we haven't done it. We then take each article and scrape it, which means pulling the different components out, the HTML, the PDFs, the PINGs, the CSVs, uh, and all the rest. Um, we then extract the facts, uh, and we've built specialist extractors to do this. Uh, we index it, and we use Wikipedia as the indexer. Every possible um, uh, entity in there, we would index with Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the primary tool for indexing science. And then we will republish it into Wikidata. And this is not vaporware. This is running now in pre-alpha form. Right. So, Here's a paper. We gave that paper to non-scientists to mark up, um, and they were able to pull out all the different terms in it, uh, the um, species, the um, dates, the places, without any training. Now, a paper like Panthro Leo looks very 
uh, intimidating. And most of you probably wouldn't read a paper like that. But it actually is about lions uh, evolving in Africa over the last few hundred thousand years, uh, and uh, whether their different subspecies uh, you know, can be understood to stop them uh, dying out. The other one, again, looks pretty forbidding, but it's actually about making soy sauce. So this is actually accessible to all of you. And this is an example of um, non-scientists. We've tried this out on uh, many people in our workshops, and they've gone through, and you can see how they've marked up different things uh, with different um, colors. And that's what we're going to ask the machine to do. So here's a machine. Uh, this is how a machine might see a bit of science. You don't need to understand this, but you can see the different things uh, that a machine might be able uh, to pick up. If uh, we're doing this really uh, properly, we actually have to understand the language at um, a semantic level. Uh, this is called shallow parsing, uh, and we've written a shallow parser for chemistry, and you can see this um, sentence up here, DMAP was dissolved in that. Now, most of you probably don't understand it, uh, and i probably the only person in this room who knows what DMAP is, but the machine knows what DMAP is, it knows what THF is, and it is able to build a complete semantic parse of that, and that semantic parse can then be turned uh, into RDF and put into a triple store. And the great thing about this is this is a fact. It is uncopyrightable. Here's a typical chemical synthesis. You don't need to look at it other than to realize it's pretty boring. Uh, but the machine uh, doesn't get bored. And that's what the machine does. It marks up every bit of that sentence. And it understands uh, that 3 bromo benzophenone is that thing on the left because we've written a, uh, a, a, a tool called Opsin, which translates from chemical names to chemical structures. And we've recently written software which can even read those structures as pixel diagrams. And we did 500,000 reactions in patents uh, in four days on a desktop. So, you know, it is here. So this is our software uh, pipeline for content mine. We start with the scientific literature, we crawl it, we scrape it, uh, we extract it, and then we're going to take the results and put it in Wikidata. And uh, what we need uh, is we need more uh, science plugins. So I've written a chemistry one, I've written a phylogenetic tree one. We need people to do maps, we need people to do um, birds, we need people to do stars. That sort of thing. It's not conceptually difficult, um, and we need the volunteers to help make that work. So we provide a platform on which it's easy uh, to put in plugins. Now, just to show you a little bit of the magic, um, I'm quoted wrongly as saying that although uh, we can't turn a hamburger into a cow, and we can't turn PDF into XML. Now, we can now turn PDF into XML. It's taken me two years. Uh, you've got this paper at the bottom left there. Oh, God. Uh, this thing is trigger happy. Uh, you've got that paper there, and that's almost impenetrable, but you can see it's got a graph. And we can turn that graph in less than a second into a CSV file. Um, and this is how we do it. We look at each part of the graph, and the graph consists of axes with tick marks, scales, quantities, units, a label for the diagram, and the points itself. There are probably 10 million graphs out there that look like this. They've all got scales. They've all got units. They've all got, well, they should have. Uh, they've all got titles and so on. So having done this for astrophysics, we've sold it for stock prices. You know, this uh, software is transferable. And when you've got that, you can do clever things. So there's that um, uh, emission from a galaxy. We can look at either the, um, uh, the general decay over the time, or we can look at the variations by using a smoothing or uh, the second derivative. Here's a phylogenetic tree. Now, you probably know that bacterial resistance is a major problem at the moment. So wouldn't it be nice to know uh, five minutes, yes. Wouldn't it be nice to have a complete tree 
uh, uh, evolutionary tree of all bacteria. Now, there's a journal which publishes this uh, bit by bit. So every new species, Sporocelibacterium faurensis, uh, is a new species. So it gets published, and this is the evolutionary tree. I don't use it, but if you go from the left to the right, that is evolutionary time, uh, at least conceptually. So this is how the thing speciates as you go from a presumed common ancestor. And Ross uh, is the person who really understands this. We're going to take 4,000 of these trees uh, and turn them into one giant bacterial super tree. And this is wonderful stuff uh, because um, uh, this is very high quality information. The stuff is marked up in GenBank, uh, which is an NIH resource. Uh, and so we can verify by machine, not by humans, we can verify by machine that this is all 100% correct. And that's the point. We have no human involvement in this whatsoever. Uh, and we can uh, get over 95% of these trees at one a second. And uh, this shows um, another tree. This is for HIV epitopes. Uh, now, the interesting thing here is that all of the algorithms that I've coded up for image processing were on Wikipedia. Thinning, uh, Douglas Poikert uh, segmentation, Zhang Xuan thinning, um, backgrounding, thresholding, um, uh, Newick trees, all of these were on Wikipedia. It is a complete uh, repository of all the knowledge I needed uh, to build a software with. This is 30 seconds out. To do science properly, we should record it as it is done. We should put it out on the web as the measurements are taken. And that is what we should, for example, be doing with the Ebola virus. We should be doing our science and putting it out for the world, literally on the day that the science is done. And this is to honor Jean-Claude Bradley, who uh, pioneered this approach um, and who sadly died very recently, and we had a memorial service for him. So this is just to uh, re uh, reiterate here, uh, we're going to take the literature. We need plugins and volunteers from ourselves uh, to help in this. And I'll finish with my wiki list. I'm going to say I put thanks here to people, uh, but I'll come back to this one. Uh, an open bibliography of science an interface for content mine to feed new facts into Wikidata, domain-specific enthusiasts, and finally, I think that Wikipedia should become a primary publisher of science in the century of the digital enlightenment. 